hey, what, what should I do? Should I buy stocks? Should I buy bonds? I said, you, you're the most valuable asset you have. Invest in yourself. The thing that's so great about the brokerage business is that there's a lot of winning involved. He says, depends how much tax you have to pay. You'd rather sell it for nine and be left with six than sell it for 10 and be left with five. You have to look for motivation. Yeah. Why is somebody selling? So it made sense for folks to burn their building down as opposed to investing in it. 85 to 90% of those buyers will not buy an apartment building in New York anymore. All right, Bob, uh, my first thought is, what are your impressions of Miami? Well, Omar, first of all, thanks for having me on today. This is great. And, uh, you know, I come down to Miami two, three times a year. Right. It is unbelievable down here. I don't know how you guys get any work done. <laughs> so nice. You want to be outside enjoying the, the, the view, the beautiful scenery. Uh, but it's awesome down here. I was able to uh, sit by the pool yesterday uh, and uh, was doing emails the whole time. But you don't feel like you're working. You're out in this beautiful weather and it's freezing in New York now. Yeah. So uh, awesome to be here. And, and thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. I appreciate you coming down. I joke with people that the view is great, but sometimes it's a Tuesday at 11 and 11 a.m. and you've got all this work to do and you're looking at <laughs> yachts and tennis and people on the pool. Yep. Um, but if you can get past those distractions and focus, I think there's a lot of opportunity down here. So I guess somewhere where I'd like to start is I'll be honest, a year and two years ago, I had no idea who you were. You're arguably the top sales broker in the world, honestly, because nobody's probably sold more properties than you and a higher <laughs> dollar amount than you. It's remarkable. So I guess after all the success you've had, talk to me about what convinced you to get into social media and maybe some of the benefits that you've reaped from it. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate the kind words. I, I think there are a couple of brokers that probably have done more dollar volume, but in terms of number of deals, you know, I do a lot of small deals, so uh, they they add up after 40 years. Um, but, you know, so the social media journey has been a really, really interesting one for me. Uh, for many years, um, you know, I, I thought that it was kind of a waste of time. Why do it? Um, and, and people were asking, Bob, hey, you have some great stories, great perspective. You know, you should really go on social media. You, you, you enjoy it. And so at the beginning of, of 2023, I said, you know what? I'm going to try it for three months, see how it goes. And I have been so surprised at the reach that it has, uh, the relationships that it has created, the opportunities it's exposed me to. Um, really, really tremendous stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I, I looked at social media kind of in December. I was figuring out, okay, how am I going to approach this? What am I going to do? And, you know, a lot of brokers are rightfully posting about their new listing or their recent transaction. But on the transaction side, most of it is, well, we just sold this for this much. And, um, you know, maybe not even mentioning the, the principles. But I thought, you know what? Let me try to convey some of the things that I've learned over time. You know, I gave a speech at Columbia a few years ago and the professor asked me to, to write down a list of lessons that I learned over the 26 years of running Massey Knackle. And I, I put that list together and folks reacted very positively to it. So I said, all right, so maybe some of that we, we mix in. Um, let's tell some deal stories, but not just, hey, we sold this for X. Let's talk about how the deal was made. What was, was the key part of it? Was it, was it getting hired? Was it overcoming a, an issue with the building? Was it overcoming a personality? Um, and so I think when you, you look behind the scenes at these deals, that's really what gets you going because um, when you see how an, an issue was overcome in one situation, you can apply that to others. So I think people like to, to learn that stuff. And then, you know, for rightly or wrongly, I've kept boxes and boxes of stuff from the old days. So I said, you know what, why don't we do the, the throwback Thursday, share some of this stuff from, uh, from all those boxes. And that's been getting a good reaction too. So I've had a lot of fun with it. Uh, and as I said, I think the most eye opening thing is that it has um, exposed me to opportunities that I would definitely not have gotten. Um, without social media. Yeah, arguably we're having this conversation because Strip Mall Guy introduced <laughs> us to and, and here we are a couple months later. That's right. I think That's what's right. interesting is we we pitch stories, we sell stories, right? So I think weaving that into the marketing of, hey, the social media posts gets people's attention of like, oh, that's what these guys do. This is how they do it. This is why they're special versus what you're saying, uh, rightfully so. A lot of brokers, I feel like, here's my listing. Here's how much money we need. Like it is, but like, okay, it's a triplex or okay, it's a 
land sale, but talk to me about why I should be investing into it. Hill you know, Omar, so much of what we do uh, revolves around um, what my buddy Ed Winslow refers to as proof stacking. Proof stacking is repeatedly letting people know, hey, I've been there, I've done that, I can do this for you, this is how I help the other person. And that over time leads to your brand, your personal brand. And if people read this stuff, um, they will know, hey, Omar can do this deal for me. He's done it for other people. He's done it well for other people and he's going to do it again. And you do that over time. And social media is a way to do that kind of on steroids. We used to do it in the old days, just hard mail. Yeah. Social media was hard mail back in those days. And we were doing it. We were, we were doing proof stacking back in the 80s and 90s by every time we closed a deal, we'd put a tombstone together, do a little write up on the deal, mail out thousands of pieces. Um, you know, we were doing a newsletter back before newsletters were very popular. Uh, started as a little four pager and grew to, I think, in 06, 07 was the height of our, our hard mail campaigns before email really got, got popular. We were doing a 38 page, 34 or 38 page newsletter, four color, do, printing 300,000 of them. Wow. Um, and uh, it was a great way to constantly show people, hey, these guys are really good at what they do. Look at all the business they're doing. And so I think that's a really important aspect that, that social media gives you an easy way to convey that to folks. I think the the challenge, like with anything, is trying to find that right balance. Right. Because and even in the, in the one short year that I've been doing it, um, there are times where you'd get too immersed in it. And you really, you could be on social media all day <laughs> long, all day. right? You know, you're, you're, you're at the doctor's office waiting to, for your appointment and you could be there, the 20 minutes goes by in like a second. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's important to get the right cadence with respect to how often are you going to do it? And you have to, you have to make those hits often. So I have, I have a social media manager, uh, Mo Regalado, who's awesome, who I, you know, I generally write all my content on the weekend, send it to her and she schedules all the postings and things like that. Um, which is, is tremendously helpful. I wouldn't know how to put a post up if I tried. Yeah. Um, but I think for everybody, it's important to find the right cadence of how much you're going to do. Um, and, you know, I've, I've now gotten to the point where one of my goals with, with Rod Santamasso, my coach, is to limit how much time I'm spending on social media every day. <laughs> so I think you, you have to find the right uh, the right balance to, right. to use it effectively and yeah. still realize that all you're doing by being on social media is trying to do more business, but doing business is what, uh, what the main objective and is. You've gotten business from social media, I take it. Uh, so far, I haven't closed the deal yet, but I'm working on a couple of things that, that came about because of social media. So we'll see. Exactly. I'd like to, to be able to connect those dots and say, hey, because of, of this, that this money came in and I think we're, that will happen sometime in 2024. I remember we sold a deal for $108 million from someone that DM'd me on Twitter. Said I'm a Amazing. big fish in the West Coast. Uh, my investors and I want to see opportunity in Florida. Like, what do you have in Florida? Sent them our pipeline of deals within like three, six months of him looking at deals. He saw one he liked. He had like a $5 million deposit on a $108 million deal. And people are like, who is this guy? Who found them? And I'm like, me through Twitter. And my whole team was like, all right, keep doing your Twitter stuff. Like you're doing great. It was funny. So I think when we first uh, connected over the phone, you mentioned the stat. And I'm curious if you're, if you're willing to share it here, that how much money do you spend on marketing dollars, like big picture to, to market yourself and, you know, the team yeah, that you yeah, have? No, no, I look, think I'm, it's very unique. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that because I think, you know, the best investment you can make is in yourself. 100%. And yeah, young people say to me all the time, you know, they just, they've made a few commissions, a few years in the business, starting to make money. Hey, what, what should I, should I buy stocks? Should I buy bonds? I said, you, you're the most valuable asset you have. Invest in yourself. So, you know, routinely I'm spending five, six hundred grand a year reinvesting in my business, either with, um, with, uh, additional support, um, or marketing materials. Uh, you know, I have a, I have a whole library of books I put together, capabilities books. We right. used to have a, just a little brochure. Now I have a, a library of nine different books that, 
you know, if somebody calls me and says, hey, Bob, I need to meet with you right now, I can grab some materials off the shelf, be out the door and, yeah. you know, do a, a full uh, professional presentation instantaneously. But I think it's important to um, to continue to enhance your capability and your ability uh, to do business and, and show clients what you can do for them. Again, the ROI that you're getting on, call it a you know, half a million dollars a year into sort of reinvesting back into yourself. That's something that we had that conversation. And I promise you, I grew up and I still am like a frugal person, not really materialistic. And I just like meeting people and doing deals and like helping people mm -hmm. out. And when I had that conversation with you, I'm like, oh my God, like how much money am I spending on social media? And I realized nothing. I was spending time, but not money. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I've actually cut down the time and I've got, you know, videographer, the editors, the whole bit. And I'm cranking up the amount of money I'm spending on myself on as a business. Yeah, well, Omar, look, you, you're building an incredible track record. And I have to commend you for a young guy. You're getting the ball out of the park. You got to let everybody know that, you, you know, are you are you writing your one page case studies for for each of the transactions you're doing? Are you doing something that, morning, you know, a newsletter. newsletter? There you go. Something you're getting out to everybody. You know, I, I one of the best marketing materials that I ever put together is I have a book of development sites I've sold. And what we've done, because again, I'm a pack rat, I save all those old pictures. We have the before picture, the after picture, which everybody loves to see that. What was it Incredible. before? Uh, you know, you can Ken Griffin site across the street. You can take a picture of the empty parking lot now. And in a few years, you'll be able to take this massive building. So I do the before picture, the after picture right up on the property. A testimonial from the client is in there. And I have a book. It's 250 pages. Mm -hmm. And I did it hardbound. I, I produced about 5,000 of those, sent them to all my clients, every every owner of a development site so that when they want to sell it, they think of hiring me. And I'll go to a client's office and be waiting for a meeting and on their coffee table in their reception area is my book. So all I can think about is other brokers going in, waiting for a meeting, seeing my book <laughs> sitting on the coffee like table. That's <laughs> right. I love it. So I want to shift gears a little bit from marketing and social media, which I think you do probably one of the best jobs in the world at, and talk a little bit about Massey Knackle. Right. My understanding is you grew this brokerage house, right? Uh, you're Paul Massey and mm -hmm. obviously yourself is Bob Knackle. And then over 20 plus years, you then go and, and sell the business. So I think it was Cushman and Wakefield. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about what made you start your own brokerage shop, right? Like I'm at Bercadia is, is my shop. And what made you start your own brokerage shop at the time? And, and let's just talk about the journey of Massey Knackle. Sure. Sure. Well, I, I, you know, I met Paul my first day on the job. Uh, at the time, CB had about 50, 60 brokers that were leasing office space, 15 or 20 that were doing retail store brokerage and four people in the building sales department. Uh, it was Paul and then three guys that had about 20 years of experience. Um, second day on the job, uh, it was very clear those guys weren't going to spend a lot of time with us. So Paul and I said, hey, you know what? Let's uh, let's just work together, split everything 50-50, right. see how it goes. And that was a very serendipitous start to uh, a 30 year partnership. Um, so a couple of years in, you know, we, we had kind of a modified territory what approach. What did you start? So? Uh, well, we started in the business in 1984. 1984. Um, and that was also Massey Knackle? No, Massey Knackle started in 1988. We were four years at CBRE, at what, what was Coldwell Banker right, back in those right, days right. that eventually became CBRE. That was around the savings and loan crisis? Just Savings and loan crisis was early 90s. Early 90s. So, yeah. So we started the company brilliantly just, just before the savings and loan crisis happened. <laughs> um, but, so uh, your, your strategy you were getting into, you basically started segmenting the market? Yeah, we, we, and this was something that at CB, they were trying to do that model. Um, and when one of those senior sales brokers came up with the deal that was in our territory, they were supposed to bring us in. The guy goes to the boss, hey, I'm not going to bring these young kids in on this deal. And the boss basically didn't make them bring us in. Yeah. So we're like, hey, this isn't fair. I thought we had some rules and guidelines here. So we we said, you know what, we're doing really well. Our second year, 1985, we made 176 grand each, which we thought we were the richest guys in New York. <laughs> so we go down to Chemical Bank and say, hey, we're starting our own business. We need a loan. We need 500,000. Where do we sign? And of course, our banker laughs at us and says, guys, that's not the way it works. Start your business. Get a three-year track record. Come back to us. We'll talk about a revolving credit line. Uh, we were dejected, go back to the office. Um, and basically for the next two years, we saved money out of every commission, uh, saved up about 400 grand. 
and then started our business November 15th of 1988. We started. It was Paul, myself, and a secretary. And uh, we just grew the business. And it was it was tough starting late 88. 89 was still a, a relatively decent year, not great. Uh, but then 1990, the wheels came off the bus with the SNL crisis. And it was really, really hard. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, Can you, you know, draw some parallels between the savings and loan crisis and the financial crisis in 08? Yeah, I think the from my perspective, uh, the the SNL crisis was a lot more difficult. Mm -hmm. In in 08, 09, it was for a much shorter period of time. The SNL crisis was, from my perspective, three or four times as long, uh, mainly because back in those days, the banks were going through the foreclosure process, which took two or three years in New York. Um, they would take title to the property. Then the REO department at the banks would hire brokers. And it was great business for us because they the, the banks were hiring exclusive brokers on everything. Um, and the RTC was was inducing them to do that. Um, but it was that was a very, very challenging time. It seemed like nobody had money. If you had money, you didn't want to spend it. Um, and so the, the GFC, I thought, was not nearly as deep uh, as the SNL crisis was. And, and we got through it a lot sooner. Right. Um, but uh, both challenging times. And that's, you know, that's what I tell everyone, Omar, is that, you know, d if you're really down about what's going on in the market today, don't get so down because the market always has been cyclical, is cyclical, always will be cyclical. Mm -hmm. uh, just take the opportunity to put yourself in the best position possible to take advantage of the rebound when the rebound comes, because it absolutely will. Yeah, really good advice I got at one point, which made a lot of sense was, hey, when you hit a recession and everybody's actually cutting back on marketing dollars and expansion, that's when you should actually push, you know, pedal to the metal because now people aren't marketing and you're the only one, you know, uh, proof stacking as you call right, it. Right, right, right. No, that that's, and that's, that's a famous marketing, um, thing in, in marketing 101. They have that example of during a, uh, a past, uh, recession or the depression. I think it was two cereal companies. I don't know, Kellogg and Post or whatever, but one of them cut back on advertising, one advertised more. And at the end of that period, the company that had advertised more was way ahead of the other one. And I, I think there's something to that. I think, you know, from, from our perspective, if you, if you look at the sales business, and I would bet that markets around the country are very similar uh, to New York in terms of sales volume. But in, in Manhattan, for instance, the average turnover rate of the stock of buildings is only 2.6% of the total stock in the average year. What that means is when someone buys a property in Manhattan, they own it for an average of 40 years. Oh my God. So people are not transacting all the time. So what, what you need to, uh, to, to, think about is the cadence with which you are contacting people. How often are you contacting them? You know, you don't have to call them every day. They're not going to be transacting every day, but, but you want to, um, you want to understand the frequency with which people are going to transact because that will impact how you do things and how often you're contacting, but you want to remain top of mind, top be of mind be exactly. because they are not transacting every day. Um, you, if they're you want their story. Yeah, you want you want to be in front of them very regularly. When that, when that 40th year hits, for example, on any given person, whether you've contacted them specifically about their building or not, they're going to know in their head, hey, I should call Bob Knackle. When well, I'm yeah, I mean, think, think about the, the, the typical people who, who have to transact, not discretionary sellers, but you have the old reliable death, divorce, taxes, partnership disputes, things like that that induce people to sell. Now, you also have a compelling strategic reasons why people may opt to sell. Um, but, you know, someone's just riding along and, uh, you know, this is well, one of the reasons why I think hard mail is so effective because um, if- To this you, day. To this day, if you're, if you're sending someone an email, and I think email was very, very prevalent. I think email is becoming less powerful because people are getting so many emails that I find myself even sometimes just, oh, I got to empty the box out. You're just kidding. Delete, delete, delete. You may delete something inadvertently or, you know, you see, oh, is, is Omar delete, delete, you know, and, and kind of like, uh, did you email me? I don't remember. But you send somebody a piece of hard mail, even if they they'll pick it up, look at it. Hmm. Oh, this is Omar from Bricadia again, uh, throws it in the garbage because they have nothing to that. To me, that's success because month after month, they're getting it, looking at it, thinking of your name, thinking of the company name, looking at it, throwing it out. 
Then all of a sudden, is, email is select all. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> you dump and, all your and, and and so then when that moment comes, when that property owner says, "You know what? I have to sell the building. Let me call that guy Omar. He's been sending me all that stuff. All that boom, top of mind." That's exactly what you want because because of the infrequency of transacting, you need to figure a way, and you can't be in front of thousands of people every day. So you need to do this. This is the stacking part of of proving what you can do is yeah. time after time after time and keep doing the, these fundamental things. So you you grew Massey Knackle. Uh, you know, give me an understanding of like where Massey Knackle was as a brokerage shop when you were selling it. Mm -hmm. And then I want to talk a little bit about, you know, why you sold it and, and, you know, how has your focus changed since as it relates to running a big company versus continuing to broker. So, so where was Massey Knackle when you were? Sure. Selling? Well, you know, the first, uh, first decade or so was pretty slow growth. Um, we started with the three of us, as I mentioned, we, we got to 21 people by 9-11. When 9-11 occurred, uh, we had 21 people, um, just about every company was downsizing, cutting back. And Paul and I said to ourselves, I said, look, New York is tough. We're going to bounce back from this. Think you look at all these great people who are out of work, brokers, lawyers, bankers, accountants. I said, let's hire these people. So up to that point, we had been interviewing everyone ourselves. We went out, hired a director of HR, said, go hire all these people. And we went on this hiring spree. Two years later, we had 150 people. Wow. So we brought 130 people on in, in two years. And that move could have sank us. But the market came roaring back. And we had all these boots on the ground and just took advantage of it. So it was great. So we grew the business, um, got to the point where uh, we're in 2007. Market is just totally on fire. Uh, get approached by a big global firm wanting to buy us, offer us 50 million bucks. We're like, wow, <laughs> a lot of money. Let's talk. So we talked to them for a while and for a variety of reasons, uh, that deal didn't happen. But what it taught us was that when we did sell the business, mm -hmm. um, we would be on five year contracts with mm -hmm. the buyer. So we looked ahead and said, well, gee, Paul will be turning, Paul's two years older than me, Paul will be turning 55 in 2015. So we should think about selling in 2014 because the perception of our productivity and the value of these five-year contracts, the buyer is going to be better if we're in our 50s than if we're in our 80s. <laughs> so let's, if the market's not in the tank in 2014, let's think about selling. So we get to 2014, market's ripping again. Mm -hmm. And we're like, we go out, hire an investment bank, um, had a bunch of bids and they were all over the place. I mean, why much wider range of offers than you get on a building sale. <laughs> uh, you know, we sold for a hundred million, but I think the, wow. the low bid was in the thirties, wow. uh, and everything in between. It was like it almost equally spread out within that range, which is really fascinating. Um, but, uh, sold the business to Cushman and, uh, you know, the, the mentioned, you know, why, why did we do it? The intention of starting the business was someday to sell it. it. Um, we didn't come from a background of having, um, a lot of resources, things like that. And we said, you know, if we're going to create real value, let's, grow this business to have it be valuable and sell it one day. Right. Um, and just our, our timing in, in hindsight, uh, our timing was perfect. But again, through no, no genius of ours, it was a decision made in 2007 uh, to sell in 2014. Um, and it just it happened to be so lucky that market conditions were perfect. It, it was a perfect storm of scenarios. Cushman, unbeknownst to us, was spiffing the company up to sell the whole company. Yeah. Uh, they had a donut hole in capital markets in New York City, needed us to fill that donut hole. Um, and just, uh, just got very, very lucky. So you sell the company very successfully. And I guess, how have your priorities or focus changed? I'm assuming in 2014, you sold the company. Yeah. You know, you're, you're people managing, you're hiring, firing, you know, you've got HR, you've got accounting, you're doing all these things. Now you're, you transition into being part of a big shop with a contract. Um, a, I mean, was there some soul searching in between the two? Um, you know, you, you got back in, uh, not back into the business cause you, you have a five-year contract, but I guess my question is you're, you're in your sixties. I'm not mistaken. Now I'm 61 now. You're 61. Congratulations. Right. Um, I had 
another one of the top sales brokers in the country, and, and I'll refrain from, from sharing his name because of what he told me. And he basically said like, Omar, what, what I've realized is that brokeraging is a young man's business, right? And he's basically, he turned that comment into why he's going to be pivoting soon. Mm -hmm. And after all this success, what, what keeps you motivated to keep brokeraging? Uh, and just bring all the energy that you do. You're in Miami. Last night, you set up a real estate event <laughs> with a bunch of people I know locally and people through mm -hmm. Twitter. We're having this conversation today. Tonight, you're the keynote speaker at the real estate gala event. You know, what, what keeps you going after so much well, success? I, I, number one, I, I love the business. So uh, the business to me is a career and it's also a hobby. Uh, you know, I have a wife and a 15 year old daughter and they're, they're my whole world. And, um, you know, if I'm not spending time with them, I'm happy to just be trying to sell some buildings, you know, and, um, you know, I often say if they went out of town for the weekend on a girl's trip, I'm going to be selling buildings all weekend. <laughs> so, um, you know, I just I love the business. I always have. After we sold the business, there was um, an opportunity to be somewhat introspective and, and figure out, okay, what do I want to do? You know, I love the Cayman Islands, but do I want to go live on Seven Mile Beach for the rest of my life? Um, do I want to start buying property? Um, and it, it occurred to me, you know what? I, I've always been really, really happy selling buildings. And in, in the, the evolution of Massey Knackle, uh, the first five, 10 years, Paul and I did everything together. We did the books together. We did the hiring together. We did painting the office together, taking the garbage out together. Um, but as time went on, we gravitated toward different areas of the business. Paul was more of the, the inside guy running the day-to-day -day operation. And I was uh, more of the salesman, just doing, doing selling, originating business. And I really love it. You know, the, the thing that's so great about the brokerage business is that uh, there's a lot of winning involved. Yeah. Um, and, you know, people today talk about kids on their phones and how they, they like to be on it because the dopamine rush. Everybody's right. talking about the dopamine rush you get. You get that? I get it from winning. And in the brokerage business, think about it. When a client calls you and says, hey, Omar, I want to sell my building. You get the dopamine it's rush, the right? You go pitch the business and you get awarded the business. You get that dopamine yeah. rush. You sign the contract. You get the rush. You sell the bill. You're closing. You get the you rush. Know I'm banging on the phones to sell the building. I'm excited to sell it. There, there's a lot of times it gives you this really good feeling, positive feedback. And I just love that. I, you know, I, I love that. And, um, you know, I have no plans to retire or slow down. I've always been kind of, if you're going to do it, do it right kind of person. Yeah. Uh, and it's just, it's just part of the way I'm built. Did you ever get close in, in a part of your career to saying, you know, I know this market cold, right? And here's an opportunity to buy a building at X that I know is probably worth Y. You know, if I can buy it for 2 million, do this and sell it for 4 million, well, why don't I do that? Right. And, and mm -hmm. the reason I ask is, you know, I, I just turned 30 last month. And as my you know, brand and audience has grown, and as my market expertise has grown, more and more people are reaching out like, we should be doing deals, right? Like I'll fund you or I'll give you money and stuff. And I'm like, very similarly, I'm like, I like, I like trading deals, you know, I, I like making you money. So right. did you ever get a point in your career where you got close to, to doing your own deals in your own market and, and think about go, going to the principal side? Yeah, well, a couple of things. I, I think during the 26 years uh, of Massey Knackle, every waking moment, we were just thinking about how to make that company successful and how to make it valuable. Right. So I think, I think buying property is not as easy as it seems. I think it's a full-time job. Um, so I didn't, uh, didn't ever think about getting into that side of the business during the MK years. Subsequent to that, and, and even during the MK years, it was part of the decision-making process also was that I think it's a, a conflict of interest. Correct. Um, you know, we, we had the simplest value proposition of anybody I know. We only sell buildings, only work with sellers, only work on exclusives. That's it. Period. Simple, no conflicts, no nothing, kept life simple, never had to remember what you say to anybody. Uh, and in the same way, when you're buying buildings, if, and, and I'm, I'm saying this is just what works for me. Right. Right? Plenty of brokers I know own a ton of real estate. Right. They're happy they own the real estate. They're doing great. Um, but I never wanted to answer the question, hey, Bob, you buy buildings. You're offering me this listing you have. If it's so great, why don't you buy it? 
I didn't want to ever have to have that conversation with anybody. Um, and so I think, um, you know, it, it simplifies things, just staying in your lane, doing the thing you do best. And I think if I ever got into the principal side of the business, I would not broker anymore. I would do that a hundred percent of the the time and and give it a hundred percent effort i yeah. think um for me that's that's the approach that works so it's funny as more people have reached out to me with, with these types of opportunities i've noticed the same thing where as my brokeraging career grows the opportunity cost of pivoting grows right and once you have i think the autonomy of the the brokerage life you know successful you're doing deals and you've got sort of a pipeline once you have that autonomy and you're making you know call it a couple hundred thousand dollars you're just like man there's got to be a really good reason for me to let this go right and and for me I'm like, I, I love what I do. Yeah, maybe if I go do a startup, I can sell it for billions of dollars and be way richer. And I'm like, but would I be happy doing that? Mm -hmm. And what I've realized is I sell Miami and I try to get people to invest in Miami is I believe in my product and I really enjoy talking to people about, you know, placing their capital here, moving here, wanting to be here. Uh, and there's something special about just doing what you believe in and what you love and being single-mindedly focused. Mm -hmm. um, so I've had a lot of people in my life like yourself that just the reason why the reason why they are who they are is because they've been doing it for 40 years. And this is the one thing they've been doing, right? If you think about Warren Buffett, it's like, I've been investing in good businesses my whole life, period. It's just so interesting. I think a lot of people especially in their 20s, as they're reading about financial advice and, and trying to make money and all these things, they hear a lot about you need to have equity in a business, right? You can't be spending your time for money, right? If you want to have a lot of wealth. Um, I guess, what are your thoughts around, you know, you have to have equity in a business as it relates to a broker like me and many others who are part of a, you know, big umbrella, big conglomerate and, and may not appear to be growing equity in a business? Well, look, I think, again, there there are pros and cons to everything. There's pros and cons to having your own business, working for somebody else, working at a big company, working at a small company. You have to figure out what things put you in a position where you're the happiest. Um, and because if you're happy, you're going to work harder and better and you'll be more successful, make more money. I think it's really important for everyone in our business to have a tax strategist talk about taxes because we make ordinary income. Yeah. Um, so you want to talk about how to hold on to as much of it as you can. You know, it's funny. I was explaining to my daughter, Sophie, about taxes. This was several years ago. And I, I asked her, she was eating an ice cream cone. I said, Sophie, if you were going to sell that ice cream cone, would you rather sell it for $9 or $10? And she said, $10. I said, that's not the right answer. She said, what's the right answer? $9? I said, no, the answer is it depends. I said, it depends how much tax you have to pay. You'd rather sell it for nine and be left with six than sell it for 10 and be left with five. Yeah. That's taxes. Yeah. And so she got it and in a big way. You need to know how to, how to invest properly, what you want to invest in. Um, you know, I, I always felt like going to work every day was a gamble. So I didn't want to risk the money that I had made. So I bought a lot of triple tax free bonds and I'm a very, very boring investor. Um, but, you know, you, uh, you it, what we do is a challenge. Also, another reason why investing in real estate for a real estate broker might not be such a great idea, because if you think about it, if market conditions get really bad, and you're not making good brokerage income because the market's so bad and your investments are in real estate, you have tripled down on one sector. You haven't diversified at all. Yeah. And that could lead to a challenging time. Yeah, I completely agree. The more I see myself burying my focus, the more I catch myself like, what am I doing? Let's go back to the basics. Yeah, plus, Omar, you know, as a, as a broker, I'll, I'll share this with you and I bet you can relate. If I look back on, on all the properties that I've sold, each time you make the deal, let's say you sell the building for $40 million. Part of the the meaty curve. part of the bell curve for offers is in the low 30s. Mm -hmm. And there'll be a few lower bids and then you have these higher bids. And then the person who's ultimately buying it, you say to yourself, seeing the entire playing field, say, wow, they're paying a really high price. Right. So in retrospect, I don't think there's a single building that I've sold that I said, you know what? I should have bought that. 
until later. Now, in retrospect, I wish I bought every single building that I, <laughs> I saw because I see how well people have done. But at the time, because you have that perspective of, uh, of, of seeing the entire playing field and where really smart people that you like and right. respect and know what they're doing, they're saying, look, I can't pay more than 32 million for this thing. That's mm -hmm. what it's worth, be it for this reason, that reason. And you're believing them, and then you see somebody paying 40, you say, wow, that's, I don't know how they're gonna make this one work. And then, you know, 10 years later, they sell it for 82, and you're like, why didn't I buy it? <laughs> <laughs> that just keeps happening, right? right? Over right. A lot of the people that I that I uh, have the good fortune of selling buildings for, they're like, 10 years later, they're like, I don't know if we should have sold that one. <laughs> and I'm like, listen, you made a profit, you recycled the capital, life goes on. Yeah, so something I want to talk about is, I guess, the market today. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like a lot of people, the general sentiment, and you may agree or disagree when I'm talking to folks is sellers are still sort of hinging on to 2021 pricing, early 2022 pricing. And it feels like buyers are thinking about 2025 pricing, where from now till 2025, there's going to be this big crash because of interest rates and all the things that's happening. How do you see the market today? Yeah, well, I think it's really interesting what's going on. You know, we came through this a period, a long period where interest rates were way too low for too long. Um, and the biggest problem in the market today is that a lot of folks have debt that's at three and a half, four percent that's maturing. And today rates are about double that. Yeah. Um, so almost every refi is a cash in refi. Do you have the capital? Mm -hmm. If you don't have the capital, the writing's on the wall. If you do have the capital, um, do you want to put it into that particular asset? And so people are really looking at their portfolios with a different perspective today, figuring out, uh, you know, dividing them into the A's, the B's and the C's. The A's you definitely want to hold on to, the C's you'll sell, the B's I don't know what to do with. Uh, so I see a lot of, of owners making those decisions about how to, uh, how to envision what their portfolio will look like years from today. Um, but it's, it's a challenge. And what has happened, I think it is positive that the Fed has kind of telegraphed Hey, we're not going to raise rates anymore. We're probably going to cut rates. Uh, it looked like pretty certain that rates would be cut by the end of the first quarter. Then the inflation numbers came out a couple of weeks ago, weren't so great. So we'll see what happens. But I think generally, um, folks believe that rates will not go up. So that, that's had two impacts. One is that many of the uber wealthy folks that we deal with, um, that for two years I've been offering them deals and they're plenty liquid and they could buy anything with the, you know, the stuff that comes out of their couch cushions. Um, <laughs> they've all said, look, it sounds like a great deal, but it's going to be cheaper in three months. I'm waiting. Uh, now that the Fed has said, hey, we may cut rates, all of that capital is saying, okay, I want to start looking at deals. What do you have? What do you have? The flip side of the coin is that the sellers right. have said, oh, rates are going to come down. My value is going to go up. So I'm not ready to capitulate at today's pricing. So you have this thing. So you have to look for the folks. And always, it's always the case, but particularly in markets where values are, are a little challenged, uh, you have to look for motivation. Yeah. Why is somebody selling? If they're selling because they think they can good, get a good price, they're probably not going to be a seller in today's market. If they're selling for one of those reasons that they, they have no choice or it's a portfolio allocation decision, or, you know, a compelling strategic reason to sell, uh, they will sell and will pull the trigger. And there's still a lot of transactions being made. Um, you know, just in Manhattan last year, 212 sales over $10 million. So there's mm -hmm. still activity going on. That's way down from, from where it is in the typical year. Um, but, uh, but still activity going on. But you have to look as a broker, you have to look for that motivation mm -hmm. and figure out who really needs to transact. When you say 212 sales over how many million? Over $10 million, over 10 million. in, that's in any, Manhattan, south of 96th Street. And that's any asset class? All, all, or just all investment properties. Got yeah. it, got it. So I wrote my newsletter this morning, as I mentioned, and in South Florida, there was 87 uh, multifamily sales above $5 million from Palm Beach County down to like West Palm Beach down to Miami. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just incredible to see how the volume has picked up. Obviously, it's down from what it was in 2021 and 2022, which was, you know, just the heydays. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just interesting to see that that volume pick up. Talk to me about sort of sentiment in New York. Has that changed over the last, you know, call it five years to over the last 
two years? Yeah, it's changed quite a bit. And, and we'll stay in the multifamily realm because that's, uh, that's something that I think, you know, you, you are very active down here. Uh, and if you think about multifamily in New York, we have this very convoluted rent regulation system, we rent control, rent stabilization. Um, and the laws, it seems like every year, the, the laws got a little bit more pro-tenant, anti-landlord. And then in 2019, we had a very significant change to the laws. Um, really, it's a shame that it's misguided policy, actually, because um, if they, I take you back to the, the late 70s, 1977, Yankees, Dodgers in the World Series, <laughs> Reggie's hitting all the home runs, Goodyear blimp pans out from Yankee Stadium, there are fires going on within a few blocks of the stadium. And the reason was, back in those times, the dilapidation rate in New York City housing was 14%, meaning that 14% of the apartments were in such bad shape they were deemed uninhabitable. Wow. Um, so it made sense for folks to burn their building down as opposed to investing in it. No so smartly, the policymakers created two programs, uh, the major capital improvement program and the individual apartment improvement program, which basically returned a, a 30% return to invested capital into the buildings by being able to raise rents. Mm. Um, and what happened was the private sector dumped tens of billions of dollars into the housing stock because of these two programs. And so in 2019, that dilapidation rate was 0.04%. Wow. Quality of the housing stock was great. And in the 2019 rule changes, a number of things went against owners, including marginalizing both of those programs such that today, when a rent stabilized apartment becomes vacant and the tenant was paying 700 a month. And in the old pre 2019, the owner would completely gut renovate that apartment, put, put it on the market, rented for $4,000. Today, that apartment is nailed shut because you can only invest a limited amount of capital and you can only raise the rent $58 a month. Wow. So if you have an apartment that you know inherently is worth 4,000 a month, why would you in, why would you rent it for seven hundred and fifty eight dollars a month? Right. It makes no sense. So um, the housing policy has has impacted the market very, very profoundly. And what has happened and this started in 2018 when the politicians who actually drafted these bills were talking about what they were going to do. Uh, it scared a lot of the, the New York folks. And, you know, we, we had. We, we have so many clients that for decades would only buy New York City multifamily. If you had a building in New Jersey or Westchester, they wouldn't look at it. New York City, it's all we're buying. And I'd say 85 to 90 percent of those buyers will not buy an apartment building in New York anymore because of these changes. So for a couple of years, 18, 19, 20, 20, even uh, I would get a call a month from a client say, hey, Bob, I'm buying of great multifamily in Miami, Omar doesn't know who I am. Could you call him and put in the good word for me? Yeah. And I hated getting those calls. Uh, now I don't get those calls ever because these folks have been investing in the local market so frequently, everybody knows them. Um, but we have a lot of new capital coming into the market um, because I think, you know, for my entire career, cap rates on New York City Multi were 150, 200 basis points lower than they were around the country. Uh, in 2020, that inverted. Um, and today, I think cap rates in New York are higher than they are around the country, mainly because all of this capital left New York, drove cap rates down everywhere else. And, uh, and now we have a whole bunch of new folks coming and they, you know, they sold their, their property in Nashville at a four cap and they're buying a six cap in New York. And, uh, it, it's really remarkable how it's changed. So the whole, the whole landscape of the multifamily business in New York has changed completely. And there are still, there's the, the 10 to 15% of those old New York families and high net worth investors that uh, are doubling down and tripling down on New York. Right. Uh, there is a wave of new younger investors, uh, folks in their 20s and 30s that are buying, hoping that the political uh, pendulum will swing uh, back into a somewhat of an owner's favor. Um, but it's really a shame. Uh, our, every Every policymaker in New York will say, we want rents to be lower. We want 
Uh, we want housing to be more affordable for everybody. Yet every single piece of legislation that's been implemented or ignored since 2018 has done exactly the reverse. It's constricted supply. It's inhibited the ability to, to build new buildings. It's, it's made uh, the owner who has that $700 apartment nailed the door shut when the client leaves as opposed to renovating it and putting it on the market. Um, so we, we have this dynamic where, you know, I, I think the solution to all of New York's housing problems uh, are on the supply side. Yeah. Uh, you look at the pandemic, and I have this conversation with politicians all the time. Look at the pandemic. People left the city, vacancy rose, vacancy rising is is tantamount to increased supply. Rents dropped 30% in Manhattan, 30%. Wow. You want to make the city more affordable, increase the supply, rents will go down. Yeah. And it, it seems like we can't get anybody to get on board with that. It, ultimately, it will have to happen because what's happening now, now that we're several years into this, um, this disincentive to invest in properties, the condition of the property is getting worse. Right. Once the tenants start complaining, once their local council person meets with them and they say, hey, our building is falling apart, do something about it. You're going to say, well, hey, the policies we put in created this. We have to change it. Yeah. Not to add salt to the wound, but it's something that makes me more bullish on South Florida oftentimes because I look at our construction pipeline. And if you drive up and down I-95, you just see cranes everywhere. And listen, it might be, you know, short term somber news if you're a landlord because you've got all this new supply coming in here. But for me, I think think about the value proposition to all the residents and future residents if rent doesn't just keep skyrocketing from 2000 a month to 7000 a month. It's going to continue driving business over here and it sort of creates a virtuous cycle of sort of, you know, traction and capital flows and people migration and things like that. Yeah, Florida, definitely. You guys are in a positive feedback loop, as right. economists would say. And, you know, when your population's growing, then your economy's growing. And when your economy's growing, you want to build new buildings. People want to come live here, work here, uh, you have advantageous tax structure. It's yeah. it's a, a lot of, of great factors. And look, I, I think New York is the greatest city in the world. Uh, I just think we need some strong leadership. Um, and some common sense, really. Um, you know, how, how have you, how do you expect things to be more affordable when you have less and less of that thing? Right. If you're not increasing the supply, right? It's just economics 101. It just, it's wild when you start seeing perverse incentives just because of all the layering and bureaucracy sometimes. Right. So I have to think, I have to think at some point, you know, that, that pendulum will swing. Absolutely. Um, same thing with San Francisco, mm -hmm. same thing with California. Mm -hmm. I think, listen, you know, when push comes to shove and to your point, things get bad enough, something needs to change and something's going to change. Right. right? And I think right now, Florida and the Sun Belt states have the momentum and I'm sure the pendulum will swing, you know, at some point in the future, right? God willing, hopefully. Um, I want to talk about a lot of people reach out to me and I'm sure much more people reach out to you about just advice to, breaking into the business to, to be Bob Knackle. For me, it's like, Omar, I want to be in your shoes in 10 years. I'm like, Bob, I want to be in your <laughs> shoes in 30 years. Um, yeah. Talk to me about general advice you typically give, uh, you know, aspiring brokers or real estate professionals. Yeah. Well, when I talk to young folks and I, I do get a lot of uh, emails and DMs asking for <laughs> advice, um, you know, I put together my, my lessons learned piece that I, I send them, but I tell everybody the three main characteristics that I see in the folks who do extraordinarily well in our business. Uh, one is they're an expert at something. They've identified a niche. They know everything about it. They're an expert. They add real value. Every conversation they have with a client, they're conveying something of real value. Um, and so that that's trait number one. Trait number two is passion. Yeah. The best people in our business really love it. Uh, and I would argue you mentioned that the the senior folk, uh, the senior guy who is kind of saying it's a young man's game. Yeah. Uh, I, I think he may have lost a little of his passion for the business. Um, but passion is, a, is an important ingredient because regardless of how good you are, this market is always going to be cyclical. There's always going to be tough times. There's always going to be the deal that you didn't make or that your, your competitor got. There's always going to be those disappointments. And whether it's a tough time or the disappointments, the passion for the business will drive you through that disappointment, drive you through that tough market, right. and get you to the other side. And then the, the third characteristic is discipline. Uh, 
You know, a lot of what we do every day, Omar, is not glamorous, <laughs> right? It's a lot of blocking and tackling, as we say. You, you have to make your calls. You have to put your reports together. You have to do your market studies. You have to look at the comps. You have to read the things you need to read to be up on the market. Um, and you have to have the discipline to do that all the time and do it consistently. And I, I love the quote by Abe Lincoln. He says that, that discipline is choosing between what you want now and what you want most. And if you set your goals and you know what you want most and everything you do is geared towards that, that will help give you the discipline to, um, to continue to do those things that you have to do those fundamental blocking and tackling things of our business day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Um, and if you don't have enough discipline and discipline, interestingly, uh, is not something you have. It's something you use. I was going to ask you. It's a tool. And if you don't have enough discipline or you can't use enough discipline, uh, get a coach like my coach, Rod. One of the big benefits I get out of working with Rod Santomasimo is that he keeps me disciplined. I, I think I'm a relatively disciplined person, but he he instills even another layer of discipline on me to make sure I'm doing it. And he yells at me sometimes. Yeah. Hey, you know, you said you were going to do this. You didn't do it. How come you didn't do it? When are you going to do it? What, give, what block of time are you going to get the, that thing done this week? And sometimes you need that. But I think those are the three key ingredients. Do you, are you an expert at something where you really can have real value in you based on what you know? Because real estate brokerage is an information business. Yeah. It's not the real estate business. Uh, secondly, do you have the passion to get through those challenging times and come out the other side and take advantage of the good times? And, and thirdly, do you have the discipline? If you have all three of those things, very likely you can get to the top of the pile here. And I think discipline is something that you can, you can practice and get better at. I think for a lot of people, maybe yourself included, like discipline came through sports or, or, or some sort of passion in a young life. And then you go and take that discipline and apply it to the real estate brokeraging career, right? Talk to me about like passion. The day you started selling properties, you're like, this is the best business in the world. Or did sort of passion grow out of doing it? No, I, you know, I think it was that my first summer, I, I, I drove around. My first summer uh, at CB and was in New Jersey, actually, which is where I grew up in northern Jersey. But my first summer job was in their market research department. I was driving around Morris County, logging information into their data bank, which any time I saw a commercial building, whether it was office, industrial, retail, I would stop the car, get out, figure out about how big it was, write down the address, who were the tenants. And I just thought it was really cool right. to see all this stuff and look at the, this type of building, that type of building. And then, you know, it was a, a great bunch of people in that office, some of whom are, are still friends of mine. Um, and I just I just thought the business was really great. Right. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I wanted to be an investment banker when I first went to the Wharton School. And, uh, you know, that first summer, I really was intrigued by real estate, really loved it. And then I had a class my first semester, second uh, sophomore more year, uh, entrepreneurial management. And we had a guest speaker come in. He said, look, I was sitting in your seat 25 years ago. I know you all want to be investment bankers, but I'm the happiest guy I know. And I sell dog food for a living. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> so he says, look, I, I got into the pet supply business and you know, it's something I'm very passionate about. I have dogs. I've always had dogs. I love pets. But, and he's just going through this, this litany of how passion is the driver of what you do. And, and in business, pick something, not because you think you'll make a lot of money at it. Pick something that you love doing. You love doing it. You'll work hard enough to get to the top of it. In any business, if you're at the top of any business, you're going to make a lot of money. I've met guys that are like plumbers, work with like radon, but they're the number one in the market here and they're multimillionaire plumbers and like radon testing people. And it's exactly that. It's sort of like find what you are passionate enough to be the number one thing at. And just do that. And to your point, a lot of the people that have a lot of success that a lot of people admire to ask them what they've been doing for 30, 40 years. And it's the same thing, right? It's incredible. And I think for me, something that I think about is when most people, or I guess I'll ask you a different question as we sort of wrap up here. Think about, I guess, Bob, yourself, when you were 30, when you were 40, when you were 50, did what you focus on change from like people management to client management and sort of where is that today? 
Yeah, well, it, it has, as I said, in the MK days, uh, Paul and I gravitated towards different parts of the business. But I think for me, um, I'm, I'm always very curious, always trying to learn. One of the, the reasons and one of the big benefits I get out of working with Rod um, is that I'm in front of best practices throughout North America. You know, some kid in Kansas City comes up with a great way to do something that nobody else thought of. I, I want to know right away. Right. Right. So I think, you know, that's that 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 competitiveness that you want to win all the time. You want to put yourself in the most advantageous position to win. Let me let me ask mm -hmm. you something. Talk to me about your team. Mm -hmm. Right. So you've got this marketing person, you've got a coach. Can you talk to me about all the you know partners and professionals that you have supporting what you do? Sure. Well, I have uh, an executive assistant. And I always say, and, and Rod will tell you, if you don't have an admin, you are an admin. Um, <laughs> That's so, so true. I don't so, have an admin. So you got to have an admin person. I have someone who essentially is director of communication that sets up all my podcasts, my public speaking, my networking stuff. Um, I have a head analyst that that crunches all the, the numbers for the deals we're working on. My partner, John Hageman, been with me for 22 years, uh, run, basically runs the team for me. Uh, I have transactional associates that, that focus on everything in the middle of the pipeline. I, I think in our business, you should be doing as much of the things that you are best at. Right. That's in the best interest of the team. So I think I'm best at, at sourcing business and winning business, which is putting stuff in the front of the pipeline mm -hmm. and then taking stuff out of the pipeline and try to have the team do as much in the middle of the pipeline. And there's a ton of really, really critical things that need to get done in the middle of the pipeline, but that you don't necessarily have to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the transactional associates do a great job of, of moving things throughout the, the center of the pipeline. And, um, you know, just constantly trying to look for new opportunities. I, I, for me, I've always been a networker. I think networking is important. Face-to-face -face interaction with folks is the best interaction you can have. Um, so I always try to do 261 networking events a year. Oh 261 God. working days a year. So I try to do one a day. Um, and some days there are none, some days there are three. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, networking is important. Making those prospecting calls has always been uh, the number one objective. Uh, and until the pandemic, uh, my goal was to make 50 connections a week. Uh, during the pandemic in 2020, I was making over 100 connections a week. Okay. And I, I figured out it was because I wasn't interrupted. You didn't have those stop and chats, as Seinfeld would say, where, you know, somebody comes over and says, how was your weekend? <laughs> Ten minutes go by. So I'm very conscious about how to, to use time and not to, to, to uh, waste time, but still still making over a hundred connections a week. Um, and so you, you think about those fundamental things you have to do, keep doing them. I just, I love it. I mean, you so give you, me a, a list of names and phone numbers and a phone and a place to, and to sit and I'm like- And some cellular connection. Yeah, I, right. I have cell service, I'm, I'm good. I want to wrap up by talking about how you structure your day. You know, uh, I've read a lot about, I do this type of work in the morning, this type of work in the afternoon. How, how you know, rigid or scheduled are you in, in, in that capacity? Uh, not very, not very. Other than, you know, I, uh, waking up early has always been important for me. And I, I very quickly found out that the goal shouldn't be to wake up early. The goal is to get to bed early. Because if you don't get to bed early, you can't <laughs> wake up early. Um, but get up early, get to the gym, get my workout in. And there's no set. To the day I, I now I'm trying to keep um, either Tuesday or Wednesday every week open free of meetings so that I can just prospect all day long you know for many many years it was a two hour chunk of time here a three hour chunk of time there to make calls which you have to proactively schedule at least two or three weeks in advance otherwise if you looked at your calendar for this coming week you probably couldn't block out a two or three hour chunk right so you have to do that in advance but I find that there's so much going on that to me, just take the whole day and make that a prospecting day. Uh, and then I have Monday as a day where I try to do as many of my meetings as possible with, with my team, with the broader uh, private capital group, with individuals, try to get those meetings all done in one day to compartmentalize day. This is something I got out of um, uh, Ben Hardy and Dan Sullivan's book, 10X is easier than 2X, is that, you know, it, that, Multitasking is a fallacy. 
the mind can't think of two separate things at one time, can't focus on two separate things at one time. So just focus on one thing, get it done properly. And chunking is really important. So now I'm, I try to do a, a full day where I'm just prospecting on that day, just getting my calls done. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's absolutely no set time. We were intermediaries, right? We're at the whim of our our clients. Uh, <laughs> there's always and, a curveball. Yeah, you know, I try, you know, even during during my prospecting time, I try not to let anything interrupt uh, those calls. But uh, but, you know, if a client calls and needs something, you need to be there for them. So you have to find that balance. But I don't have a a highly structured day where certain times of certain days of the week, I'm doing certain activities. It's pretty free flowing depending on what's needed, but you just, I have to make those prospects. You have to calls. make the time. That's yeah. the only, uh, not set the time aside. Absolutely. Right. Bob, any parting words? No, just, you know, everybody I know today is concerned about the market and what's it going to be like this year, what's going to be like next year. And as I, I said earlier, oh, it's always been cyclical. The market is going to get better. Uh, we just have to fight through these these challenging times. And, um, you know, when it comes back, I think it's going to come roaring back. So put yourself in a position to take advantage of that and know that it absolutely positively will come when nobody knows, but it will come back. Bob, you're a huge, you're a huge inspiration. I appreciate the time you've taken today and I'll let you get back to enjoy Miami. Great to be with you, Omar. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely.